What is it with the Soviet Guards armies, corps, divisions and other units in World War II? Were they elite units? Was the title earned or just given? What about the Guards air units or the Katusha units? Well, time to find out. First, although by the end of 1941 only 10 rifle divisions had earned the title, by the end of the war there were more than 100 Guards rifle divisions alone. But the Guards title was not limited to the infantry. There was also the Guards tank divisions. Now the origin of the Guards title is actually inherently non-communist. According to Sharp it goes back to Peter the Great and various monarchies, yet continued into the Russian Civil War. Although the concept of guards in the European armies is aristocratic and monarchical, the forces largely began as Leibgarde or bodyguards to the sovereigns, they did not disappear from the Russia when the monarchy did. Instead, during the Russian Civil War both sides proliferated white guards, red guards, proletarian guards, Cossack guards, revolutionary guards, until on occasion it seemed as if every ragged rifle unit was a guards formation. Sharp notes that this was done for morale support. He further notes that this was also the reason why the Soviet infantry divisions were named rifle and not infantry divisions. All the basic infantry adopted the title rifle, Strelkoivi, instead of infantry, Pekotti. After all, the rifle units in the old Imperial Russian army had been the elite line infantry and the different titles served to set the red units off from the foreign and white counter-revolutionary counterparts. Note that some infantry units like the naval infantry were still called infantry. After the civil war the units had to drop their guards title. So let us look at the second world war. Most authors mention the guards with September 18th order. For instance Hill notes in an order. 18th September 1941 Stalin made the 100, the 127th, the 153rd and the 161st Rifle Division's 1st to 4th Guards Rifle Divisions, respectively for the military achievement, the organization, discipline and exemplary order, with increased pay for the personnel and promise of distinct uniforms. The distinct uniforms did not, in the end, materialize, although a Guards badge was introduced. This is in contrast to Sharp that notes that there was actually a previous revival of the Guards. The first revival was local by the Leningrad Soviet, which is organizing militia units in that city after the first wave of militia was formed and sent to the front in July 1941. Leningrad began forming a second group of three, later four militia divisions. A large percentage of the men and women in these units were communist party members, candidates or young communists. To empathize that these were elite, the guardians of communism and Leningrad or Lenin city, the local Leningrad organization designed these units as the 1st, 2nd and 4th Leningrad Militia Guards divisions. What is very interesting is that while I was looking at the war diary of the 1st Panzer Division, I came across an entry that mentions such a guard division. And they knew and commented on its background to quote the diary. The following enemy units appeared before the division. In the dubitzo pit section, Parts of the 291st Reserve Division, in the section Marzino, parts of the 2nd Guard Division, Leningrad Militia Army. Leningrader briefly trained civilian militia of the Red Militias. Combat value of both divisions low, but animated by tenacious will to resist. Although this designation was short-lived according to Sharp, the Leningrad Party organization had a history of independence from Moscow and this indication of it lasted less than a month. By the end of August the order came from the center to drop the guards titles and shortly afterwards in September all the militia formations received regular army rifle division designations. Although Sharp refers to the September order and calls it the real birth of the guards, he particularly stresses that the reintroduction of these guards was motivated by the dire situation of the various Soviet formations in 1941. Additionally adding that this was not an uncommon problem, namely that good peacetime formations exhibited problematic behavior during wartime, something that was also an issue for the German army in Poland as outlined in this video. Sharp notes that some units like the 100th and the 24th rifle divisions fought well, whereas many other high rated divisions just fell apart. 
The answer is a few reliable formations began to appear in the wreckage of the summer campaign of 1941 was to specifically and unequivocally identify those units that could do things right. That way not only could the staff know what they could rely on, but a standard could be held up to other units that they could strive towards. This is slightly different to the views of Alexander Hill. The institution of the guards designation was perhaps not an act of desperation. The Elnia victory was for example a genuine, even if subsequently exaggerated victory. Despite heavy losses, 100th Rifle Division had achieved some success and as a meaningful unit survived to fight another day. Yet both interpretations are rather similar. Also if we look at the numbers, more than 120 Rifle Divisions earned the Guards title during the Second World War and countless non-infantry formations as well. Additionally, although for the infantry formations there were differences in authorized manpower and equipment, this was less the case for armor formations. Furthermore, it is arguably how substantial the differences were, since most units never reached the authorized strength or were not issued the proposed equipment. But more on the debate later. So the question now arises in which way were the guards unit different and in which way they weren't. After all, at least one high rank Soviet general, the commander of the 62nd Army Shuikov noted, in January 1943 the guards divisions weren't really all that different from other divisions highlighting desertions from the 13th Guards Rifle Division. One clear difference was that for the division is the name and number changed. Not only did the Guards title precede the name, the original division number was replaced. So the 100th, the 127th, the 153rd and the 161st Rifle Divisions became the 1st to 4th Guards Rifle Divisions. Considering the often ongoing rivalry between military units being distinguished by a new formation name and number likely was a source of pride. Similarly, Hill notes, In the case of the guards designation, if Rusilanov's memoirs are any indicator of his feelings in September 1941, the designation was certainly a source of pride, as he recalls it being for men of the division. Such devices probably often provided a boost to motivation, particularly when they came with material benefits as well as prestige. Be aware that the number is not necessarily in ascending order. At least some of the higher numbers like the 125th and 128th Guards Rifle Division received their title in 1943, whereas others like the 115th Guards Rifle Division received their title in 1945. Yet the Guards designation was not limited to units and formations. According to Rottmann, the Guards title started to precede the rank titles of the personnel as well by May 1942. From May 21, 1942, guards preceded rank and titles and guards badge was authorized for wear on the right breast. Just to be sure I double checked this and looked at various high ranking officers of some late war units. For instance, the chief of staff of the 4th Guards Tank Brigade was Guards Lieutenant Colonel Pavel Chepkov. And all the other officers listed by Nevolsin were as the chief of staff of the 1500 self-propelled artillery regiment was a major Alexander Longinov. Yet it seems that once someone had the guards title it stayed even if it was assigned to a different unit, although this is my interpretation based on the following data. 74th Mortar Regiment Commander Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Pitalev Deputy Commander for Personal Major Boris Kuldonov Assistant Commander for Supplies Guards Major Pavel Zemchuk Chief of Staff Guards Major Yakov Veselov Similarly of the three officers listed for the 51st separate engineer battalion, one has a preceding guards before his rank, whereas the other two don't. Although initially it was planned to provide the personnel also with a different uniform, this did not happen. Yet the men were authorized to wear the guards badge on the right breast. The guards badge had a gold wreath, white enamel center with a red enamel star and red enamel banner with cyrillic guards in gold. Additionally, guards received higher pay, in some cases more than double the amount of regular troops. Another difference was when it came to replacements, especially when it came to the return of the wounded to the original units. Although it's hard to tell how well it worked, in December 1941 the Soviet Ministry of Defense issued that guards should be kept as close to the front lines as possible in order to allow them to return to their units. Yet the issue was stressed again in 1944. The need to return wounded guards troops to their own units or at least another guards unit was stressed in the same February 1944 general staff document 
that raised concerns about the locally recruited criminal elements and traitors to the motherland from occupied territory finding their way into guards units. This of course raises the question if the order from 1941 had been followed properly, why was this mentioned again? As mentioned previously, infantry were not the only guards units. The first guards tank brigade was designated in November 1941. Yet the guards tank units were far fewer in numbers. Namely only seven guards tank brigades existed before summer 1942. And as such their impact was rather limited. More importantly, for the remainder of the war the Soviet command made no organizational distinction between guards and regular armor brigades or corps. As such, unlike the Guards Rifle Division, there was no difference in the table of organization and equipment between Guards Tank Units and regular tank units. Although, the only distinction was that in 1944 Guards Corps tended to be re-equipped with t 34 85s a little earlier than regular tank or mechanized corps. On the other hand, a number of regular corps had heavy assault guns or tank regiments earlier than their Guards counterparts. The distinction was based more on the anticipated mission of the Corps than on its past history or title. Note there were two major exceptions. The first namely the first and second guards mechanized corps. Since they were based on rifle formations as such they had a bit of a different setup according to Sharp. The second exception were the guards tank regiments. These units received the guards title without proving their combat effectiveness beforehand. These units were equipped with heavy tanks. Although they were equipped with heavy tanks, the KVs removed from the regular tank brigades after July 1942, they were not designated as heavy tank but as breakthrough tank regiments. The task was to accompany the rifle units and lead them in breaking through German defenses, the toughest job on the Eastern Front. A bit more on this later. In contrast to the tanks, the naval infantry had similar changes like the guards rifles, according to Hill. The naval brigades experienced the same organizational changes as normal rifle brigades and several received guards designations for their accomplishments in combat. Similarly, the guards air units were also treated in a way that seems consistent with guards infantry. According to Hill, these units at times received better equipment and replacements, for instance trying to return previously wounded pilots to their original units. There are also some contradictory aspects when it comes to the guards. The first one is of course the cultural shift away in terms of the ideals of the communist revolution and the other is the question about the fact that if the title was always earned. About moving away from communist ideals, Hill notes, in many ways the institution of the guards designation was part of the first wartime phase of cultural shift away from the symbolism and ideals of the revolution that had started in the late 1930s. Revolutionary ideals and symbolism that had, amongst other things, for example, hampered the authority of commanders and prevented the development of a Soviet general staff and training of staff officers through the academy of the general staff or equivalent. The Red Army was now returning to Tsarist and Bourgeoisie symbolism and practice in a significant way. Technically, the title of guards had to be earned, yet there were at least two exceptions. The first were the Katusha units. These were named Guards Mortars even before September 1941, when the guards designation for the rifle divisions was ordered. As Brennant notes, in early August 1941 the first eight guards mortar regiments were formed as part of the reserve of the Supreme Command. Similarly Armstrong notes, the title was a designation that would continue to protect the true nature of the new weapon and offer some deception in the Red Army order of battle. The second were the previously mentioned guards tanks regiments. While the majority of rifle divisions, tanks or mechanized corps became guards as a direct result of demonstrated combat effectiveness, the Soviets also bestowed the guards title on units which had not distinguished themselves yet, but by their equipment and tasking were expected to perform difficult combat tasks. Additionally it seems that some airborne units were just renamed into guards airborne units, although they might have earned it, yet the way Glantz writes it, it does not seem that way. When the Red Army began expanding its new winter offensive in late 1942, the People's Commissariat for Defense, basically the Soviet Ministry of Defense, responded to the Stavka's request for additional forces by converting its airborne forces into the 1st through 10th Guards airborne divisions and dispatching them, first to the Northwestern Front and later to the Kursk region, where they once again fought as elite ground units. Since airborne forces were generally better trained, it seems 
that here we also have the situation that based on the task expected from the unit the title was applied. Furthermore, Sharp notes that some airborne formations had distinguished themselves already. The airborne troops reputation in 1942 was elite infantry and there the record was impressive. The 13th, the 37th and the 39th Guards Rifle Divisions, all composed of paratroops made enviable if bloody reputations for ferocity on defense and counterattack at Stalingrad. According to Zaloga and Ness, these formations were also equipped like Guards Rifle Divisions. Although filled out with trained parachutists and retaining the airborne designation, these units converted to the regular Guards Infantry Division table of organization and equipment and fought as regular infantry. To summarize, although the term Guards Rifle Division, Guards Tank Division and others show up regularly in the literature, the devil is clearly in the detail here. Most Guards unit and formations had to earn the title, yet some like the Katusha and Brig 2 tank units had the title by default. Additionally, there was clearly a change over the course of the war and overall my impression is that this topic is not really well covered in western literature so far, as such take everything in this video with a grain of salt. Well, I hope you learned something new, thank you here to Jens on discussing various issues with the state of research and other aspects about the guards, thank you to Andrew for reviewing the script, thank you to all my supporters on Patreon and Subscribestar, as always sources are listed in the description, thank you for watching and see you next time.